And, uh, and you know, right, when you were on that long walk trail, if you were sick, if you couldn't make it, they killed you. Yep. If you were old, grandma or grandpa or a child, they, they just kind of like killed you and yep. because you couldn't held, keep couldn't keep up, yeah. Anything scary that you've experienced in the rest? And then it came back to one and then it disappeared. And I was like, what is that? Like, did we really see that? You know, we're all like, person who's passed away, I think traditionally they used to rip up their clothes, right? Cut it up maybe. And that's how they buried them. Um, people who do this and not probably know it. They know the stories. But even and, the last part? Yeah, the last part for sure. And um, he was killed by a Navajo man called um, Chish Chilibia. So do you want to like get lunch or something? Yeah. Or? Should we go get lunch? Oh, yeah. All right. He's a he's a really good driver. He's a Che driver. Oh, yeah. cool. I'm insured, yeah. so I'm comfortable either way. <laughs> the Che driver. Yeah, they'll they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, he he, he bought her he bought her a nice house, you know. Uh, uh, he you know he does this for her and. He's like hell yeah, I did. You know, and he, you know, like you know, like with each other. I didn't I didn't have like a great well paying job, but when you were a graduate student, then we didn't worry about. So how long have you guys been together? Ten years. About ten years. Ten years? Yeah. Oh, okay. How long have you guys been married? Six. It's going to be six this year, oh, all right? Seven. Or seven. It's going to be seven this seven. year, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, it sounds like you guys are in a very healthy marriage that take care of each other. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and that's all that matters. But he definitely takes care of me. Yeah. Good. We understand when there's not enough hours in the day to uh, make our house look perfect, but we have guests who kind of distress about it too much. Well, again, it's there's nothing wrong with also having a house that looks lived in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because yeah. you know, what, what, when you have family over who are, especially Navajos, they don't want to mess up things, so they they <laughs> kind of sit there like tense at the Just edge like, of the couch. Like yeah, they sit like that yeah. at the edge, edge of the couch. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to touch anything because it's nice and clean, it looks pretty. They don't want to mess it up. Like, no, oh, enjoy yourself. Dig around in the cupboards. Make some dirty dishes. <laughs> then Make when you're done, now sweep, sweep. Yeah, <laughs> sweep. No, no, no. Where are you going? Where are you going? Come back, come back. Why are you going home now? So, yeah. like you two, I'm also in the half. You know, my 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 wife is white. So, what's the challenges of you not being Navajo? Like cult um, culture wise. I mean, I'm, I'm Navajo though, aren't I? I'm adopted. I'm <laughs> I'm, I was so welcomed by her family. That, and but I think I was you know I was patient and I listen, try to be respectful and listen but would participate in, in family activities and, and ceremonies even early on and that you know kind of went a long way to welcoming me um, into her family her mom and dad were were really great um, and made me feel welcome so yeah I am Baba. Nice. <laughs> so what were the most eye-opening experiences that you had? Um, I think getting used to being in a large family because I'm an only child and so like you know some of the earliest things we did was like going to the birthday parties of nieces and nephews and trying to meet everyone and remember too many names um, so I think what you asked was like what was the, the challenges of it right um, but I think that was yeah that was a big adjustment because I'm from a small family uh, getting used to be uh, being part of a really good one are they? It's there. They're is it too windy? They circle the wagons here, but no, something's still open on the side yeah. right there. They might have just closed the front and opened yeah. the side. Shall we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I it's just fun. want mutton sandwich with uh, no green chili. No green chili. Can you get me um, a mutton sandwich as well, too? Anything scary that you've experienced on the res? Oh, anything oh, scary that I've experienced on the res? No. Really? No, I'm trying to think. Nothing running along your car, nothing running off? No, there or... was one. In, so I used to go to school at, in, in Sahili Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And then I went to school at Rock Point. And I think my dad one time picked me up late at night. It was in the winter. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Maybe pick me up from the dorm. And no, uh, no tortilla today. No tortilla. Okay, fried bread's still good. Thanks. And yep, um, thank he you. picked me up, and 
we were driving back to uh, my Nelly lady's house where we were living at the time up in Round Rock. Mm -hmm. And it was late at night and it was in the winter and the roads were very muddy. Uh -huh. So you, ha you had to know how to drive in the mud, I think, to get up and down. I don't think I could do it. Yeah. Um, and there was one place where everyone got stuck. Everyone got stuck there, you know, unless you had the right vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Like, a, I don't know, big old truck maybe. Big old dually, yeah. like 250. <laughs> yeah, with the tires. Yeah, if yeah. you had that, you and know. And weight. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we were able to afford a vehicle like that when I was younger. But we got stuck. And so normally we would just sleep in the vehicle, right? But yeah. for some reason, my dad was like, let's start walking. We got to go, you know? And I'm like, okay. And we were walking along and um, um, my dad had his arms around me and I was holding on to him. And he's like, just keep walking. And then I go, dad, I said, is someone walking behind us? Right? And he said, don't look back, just keep walking. But from his body movement, I could tell he was looking back, right? Yeah. He goes, just ignore, just ignore it. You know, he told me, just ignore it and keep walking. And we walked. I think we walked quite a bit. We got near the, um, we probably walked, I don't know, half a mile, three quarters of a mile. And um, and thankfully, my cousins at the time, my cousin, these um, young men at the time, they would like look out. So if they saw a vehicle headlights coming, they would expect a time of arrival, right? If that didn't happen, then they would drive out and mm. see if the person needed help. So they finally drove out and they picked us up. And um, I was like, dad, you know, I think later on I asked my dad, dad, what was that? He goes, ah, he goes, it was a skinwalker that was following us, you know? Oh, and I'm wow. like, he goes, and I told you not to look back, remember, and just ignore it. And we walked. I was like walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like walking as fast as I can, trying to stay calm and just holding on to my dad for dear life. <laughs> yeah. Little legs but right I, up. you know, I didn't see anything. Oh. Um, I just I was like, I knew I was hearing some noise behind me. Yeah. And I was just hoping someone, someone would drive up and, yeah. you know, come pick us up and stuff. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. When, when my dad, and mom used to live in Fort Defiance. My dad still worked in Farmington. Mm -hmm. And he would drive over in Arbono Pass. Mm -hmm. And one morning, he was headed over early in the morning, cloudy like this. And he saw something white in the sky. He thought it was a piece of trash. Mm -hmm. And he turned, and as he got close, he realized, oh, that's a jellyfish. <laughs> he said he saw this thing going up and down like this. Oh, wow. Yeah, up in the sky in Arbono. And he, got closer and he looked up and it was about a hundred feet in the air and he freaked out and he noticed there's two of them two jellyfish yeah <laughs> in the sky above the chuskas and he he put on some music really loud stepped on the <laughs> he just all that down the mountain he's like yeah he's like, i never want to go over early <laughs> morning again <laughs> what's that uh when i was in wheat fields we used to camp out there during so the we used to, we used to be avid campers when I was in my early teens to go to these um, church Bible camps. Mm -hmm. They had one at Conwood Pass, another one was in Wheatfields. <laughs> when we go to Wheatfields, it wasn't as fun because it wasn't deep into the forest like um, Cottonwood. We, we only went there to play volleyball and go camping. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we wanted to see friends or distant relatives. So one night we're busy camping or grilling on the campfire, just telling stories, and then we saw these lights. Like, oh, we got more um, planes coming in. Mm -hmm. Then it started slowly breaking apart. We're like, that was weird. And then one started speeding up really fast. We're like, that's strange. And then soon all of a sudden they just, whoop, like just shot up to the sky like nothing. Mm -hmm. Right above the mesa. And Where is this at again? Wheatfields. That's, that's funny because... That's uh, it, South yeah, Pasadena between... Yeah. In Round stuff. Rock, when I was a little girl, we saw um, like this real bright star or something that appeared. And then it three things came apart from it like that. Yeah. So, and then... But they didn't disappear. They kind of came apart. And so you could see these three stars. Yeah. And, you know, by now, every, we're all looking at it like, what is that? Because you know, we hang out outside yeah. at night, yeah. look yeah. at the sky, stargazing. Yep, stargazing. And then we saw this thing that broke up into three. And it's just there. And then it came back to one and then it disappeared. That's crazy. And I was like, what is that? Like, did we really see that? You know, we're all like... <laughs> 
traditionally, we're not supposed to wear ripped clothes and rings on certain fingers because those are only for dead people. Mm -hmm. So w what's the story behind that? person who's passed away, I think traditionally, they used to rip up their clothes, right? Cut it up maybe. And that's how they buried them. In oh. fact, I know some people who whose relatives prepare when it gets closer to when they know they're getting ready to go, that they prepare their own clothes mm. and they cut it up and rip it up and they say, don't look at this, but when I'm gone, this is my clothes for me to, to bury me in. Um, I, I was thinking maybe it, is it because, because we do hear that they go into a different world. Yeah. Right. So and that, I think that's part of the reason why we're not allowed to mourn so much and cry and keep their pictures around and, you know, have different things of them around in this world because they move on to a different world. We can't hold them in this world. We can't hold them, yeah. Yeah. Um, but and then I was like thinking, it makes me think of like like movies, right? And I'm thinking like maybe in, in that world, their clothes are in the right form if it's ripped here. Mm -hmm. You know, I, like I think yeah. about things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of like the, mm -hmm. not even. But they're, know. but they're not, they're not of this world anymore. They're yeah. different. They, they become something different. Yep. So you, you have to let them be who they are now in that world. I think that was my Nelly man's, um, his teaching was that when someone dies, they're, they're not, well, obviously they're not human anymore. I mean, well, well, they are, I guess, in form, but they're not. They're not a human. They're not human here form. anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're not a person anymore that they live, literally have moved on into a different, different world. Yeah. 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 So, That's but yeah, they, you know, like they put their shoes backwards, you know, ripped their clothes mm -hmm. and I guess put their, yeah, I was told that you don't wear your rings on your thumb or your pointer finger mm -hmm. because that's where they put um, their jewelry when when they pass away they if they have rings they put it there mm, interesting. yeah but because also you're not supposed to point either <laughs> yeah, yeah but also though if you think about it if you were to wear a ring on your thumb or your pointer finger it if you were to lose your thumb or your pointer finger because of the ring let's say it got attached to something it ripped it out you no longer have that that, be useful that human ability right yeah because you're just those three because now all you have are just these three yeah <laughs> like what are you going to do with those three nothing safety <laughs> so. measures because most mm -hmm. of you we rode horses yeah because mm -hmm. you don't wear rings when you wear horses ride horses mm -hmm. yeah safe because it can it yeah, can pull out your, your your thumb or something right or just rip off your skin to the bone which yeah. i've you see? Heard. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard, heard like 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 calf ropers yeah. i've heard of a guy who's like thumb just got yep it happens real quick yeah even construction and stuff gets quick and soon. It's just your bone left. Mm -hmm. But normally you can um, connect those those kind of teachings to a ceremony. Then if you know that ceremony, you know the songs and the prayers that go with that ceremony, then you're able to understand those stories. Ah, interesting. Yeah, that's kind of what I've learned. Mm -hmm. For like ripped clothes and stuff, you probably need to find someone who does maybe a hochwanja. I told you. like the blackening, the blackening ceremony. Mm -hmm. So they have, they have stories. Like we took my niece to one guy and he was telling us that this, the ceremony emerged from when the two twins, you know, they went and killed people and stuff. And then, um, you know, they came back and they needed to be cleansed of, of, the, of what they've done. Right. Yeah. And so they had that ceremony. There's a, a section where I didn't quite understand it. But in performing the ceremony, um, they walked somewhere and they came a, a, a upon a hole in the, in the earth. And they looked down and down there they saw the, the person that had passed, some person that they knew that had passed away. Yeah. And they're like, oh, you know, like, and one said, Oh, hi, you know, like they tried and then they tried to communicate, but they're not supposed to do that. Mm. They were not supposed to get that person to notice them, but they did. Right. And so they had to have the blackening ceremony. 
because that was a dead person and that the person came and followed them. Oh, I see. Um, and so they put this ceremony, they do this ceremony, they make you all black, and that's to hide you from the dead. And then when the medicine man goes outside, he gives an offering. And it's kind of like a distract. The way he described it to me, it was like, it's like a distraction. So it's like this a person who has passed away is kind of like, like stuck on you, right? Mm -hmm. And um, kind of paying attention to you, and you're having all these ailments because of this person, yeah. um, of this of the, someone who had passed away. And um, so what they do is they give them something, an offering. Mm -hmm. So while they're busy here with, the, while the, the this person, whoever is ghost, let's say, is busy with the offering, being distracted by it, you get blackened up over here and then they do like a smoke screen for you mm -hmm. and so by the time they look back up they the person that they were haunting maybe mm -hmm. right is they like they, they've lost that connection to yeah, them because yeah. now yeah okay that makes sense yeah so now they have this offering in exchange i think also as a payment to like let go but gotcha. yeah but the way he described it to me was like to distract them mm. yeah and i was like oh sense. so Jenny, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, the squad dance is actually pretty interesting, too. So you know how in Navajo culture books, you have these stories of the warrior twins, the hero journey, the hero twins, the journey, you know, the journey to the sun, the birth of the twins. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear that, right? We have changing women, then we have the birth of the twins, and then we have, like, the monsters that they had to kill, mm -hmm. right? And then they had to journey to their father. I think they journey to their father first before they kill the monsters. And then when they're done, right? So this is what we hear in books. This is what we learn in school. Yeah. What we don't hear is when they're done and they come back um, and they're having to cleanse themselves of of being in war mm -hmm. and that's what the nada is that story continues right there with the nada where it's um it turns out like the the setup of the ceremonial grounds has a story it's set up a certain way mm -hmm. right um so they come back and they have this nada ceremony this the nada ceremony is like a reenactment of what they did, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of war, right? And then at the at the very end, they have that, um, the, the, the nada ends with mm -hmm. And apparently today, a lot of people don't do that, but that's, I was told that's a very, very important piece that you can't ignore, that it needs to be done because that kind of brings everyone back into harmony. National da. National yeah, like there's the socialization, you know, there's the, I think it's like a festival, you know, eating, not a festival, but, you know, like eating, mm -hmm. there's a socializing, there's dancing that goes on. Mm -hmm. And and um, and apparently today a lot of people kind of leave that off hmm. because no one wants to maybe dance. I don't dance when I go there. Right? I just kind of like just sit there and eat. I'm, well, usually, <laughs> I'm usually busy working. <laughs> yeah. But this is the kind of stuff that my dad used to tell me, right? Yeah. So we were sitting at a squad dance, and he started telling me this, and I'm like, wait, you mean they left out, like, the whole second half of things? Yeah. Huh. He's like, yeah, they did. They don't, they don't, it's not written in textbooks and, or books and stuff. Wow. Mm -hmm. is, is anybody else who would know about that? Um, people who do this and dot probably know it. They know the stories. But even know. the last part? Yeah, the last part for sure, because... Yeah. The, the way that a dot happens has a story and a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, and the way it's, the procedure is based, it has, there's a reason, there's, it's based on a, on a historical story of the hero twins. By the time I became of age to be interested and willing to go sit in with my dad, you know, my dad passed away at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He uh -huh. attended, all, that's all he did. He attended a lot of ceremonies. All over the Navajo Nation. He just went from place to place. He was an activist, activist, like did, was always somewhere supporting something, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're about <laughs> You know, that. things like that, right? Yeah. yeah. But he also had this like cultural knowledge that unfortunately I didn't get a lot of it. Mm -hmm. 
So when people talk about things, I listen and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember. Oh, that's what my dad was saying. Okay, you know, so I can kind of piece some, some things back together. Yeah, talking about the long walks, I told you I was going to share this with you, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't know if you know the story of uh, Richard Weatherwheel, who was at the time located at um, Chaco Canyon. No, 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 I don't. And um, he was killed by a Navajo man called um, Chish mm -mm. No, you don't know the story? <laughs> I don't oh, really? Know. So they also call Richard Weatherwill back then Nahuilpihe. So um, Nahuilpihe is the name of the gambler in the traditional Navajo story. Okay. And they call them that because what he was doing is he was hoarding everyone else's wealth for himself. Okay. Like he took people's horses, you know, their cattle, you know, their, their, their sheep, um, their rugs, their jewelry. You know, he was this... According to our stories from Lake Valley, he was this really, really greedy man, mm -hmm. and he was like a, like a huge bully mm -hmm. in Lake Valley area. Mm -hmm. So my family is from Lake Valley, right? And um, my so there's me, and then my mom, and then her mom, my grandmother, and then my grandmother had a mom, but her mom died when she was very young. So my grandmother's name is, ha, my grandmother's name was Hasba. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know what her mother's name was. I don't think she knows because her, her mom died when she was young. She was raised by her grandmother, who was, um, I think, Kehanaba. Mm -hmm. And Kehanaba was my mother's great grandmother. And my mom actually spent some time with her great grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so there's kind of two stories here, right? Mm -hmm. And Kehanaba was the daughter of, uh, what was her name? Bish. Yeah, the Navajo, they only have Navajo names, and I should remember her name. Um, yeah, it is Bishajizba is was the name. And Bishajizba actually came back from um, Huelte. Mm -hmm. so, so there's one story there, but her daughter, Kehanaba, um, was married to Chisht mm -hmm. and her husband was the one who went and killed Richard Rutherwell. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the story goes, according to my grandmother, that um, Chisht returned home from maybe Farmington, mm -hmm. returned home, and um, a, a neighboring a neighbor, the wife of his really good friend, came over. Um, you know, asking for help, like, you know, like my husband, you know, they kill my husband and stuff. And um, can you help me? So he went with her to her house and, you know, and found that his best friend had been um, beat up and, you know, like, like beaten to death. Mm -hmm. right? And so and that, and then his horses were taken and like their wealth was taken from them. Yeah. yeah and yeah. it was by Richard Weatherwill and his cronies. Is that what they call yeah, them? Right. Yeah. And uh, so they took, and they did that to a lot of people in the area. Mm -hmm. And so what Chish Jalibiyat did was he was, apparently he was really pissed off. And he said, I am going to go, go kill this guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to go kill Richard Rutherwell. He obviously said it in Navajo, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, he said, I'm going to go kill Nahuilpihe, um, I'm going. So some people joined him from Lake Valley. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so they they went straight over. So here's Lake Valley, and Chaco Canyon is east of Lake Valley, yep. where where he's um, where Richard Weatherwill had a maybe he had a trading post or mm -hmm. something there. I haven't read things on that side, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so in the evening they went, or after they, they took off and they got there in the evening, and the first person, um, Chish Libya, as soon as he saw Richard. Rather, rather real. He, he, he just, he just killed him, like no questions asked or no yeah. negotiate. Just killed him, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's you know. So that's what he's known for, right? <laughs> In my family. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then after that, they went and they, you know, they had people get their their cattle back and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, their horses and everything that he had hoarded and took from everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, they took it back. Because, you know, it, it wasn't his, right? Yeah. And so, 
And then afterwards, Chisht Libya turned himself into the BIA um, police, I think, mm -hmm. in Shiprock. Yeah. So there's records of him where he went to court. He went to court here in Santa Fe, and then they just released him back to Shiprock. Yeah. Um, and said, yeah, you can just hang out in Shiprock maybe. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't like sit in a prison or anything. Um, just stay close by. Yeah, just stay close by. So he helped them out there for a while, and then they finally told me, yeah, you should just go home now. <laughs> and I think he went home, but I think he was sick also mm. by the time it was, by the time they let him go home. And perhaps it was because he was sick that they let him go home. Yeah. Um, but um, his court records, you know, they're at Aztec. You oh, know? Nice. So I heard my dad was really encouraging me to go take a look at them. Oh, okay. I, um, he gave me more information. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, so that's who... Um, my grandmother's, I guess, great, her great grandmother, um, that, so that's my grandmother's great grandfather who, um, killed Richard Weatherwell. Yeah. That's awesome. And so the stories you hear though, is that he was, mur well, he was murdered, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, they make it sound like he was murdered for, f Oh know. yes, like random killing. Yeah. So, you know, but it, it, that wasn't the case. It's because everyone in Lake Valley was being tortured. Like, that's... yeah. Justified homicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, my grandmother's um, great grandmother, um, she was, uh, her mother was, um, what did I say? Bilhazizba? Yeah, Bilhazizba. Her and her sister were um, uh, left from Farmington area. Yeah. So there's a lot of Tsenaha Bithnis in that area between farm, what is now Farmington and Shiprock, you know, all along the river right there. <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, Tsenaha Bithnis there, but that's where they were. Um, I think that's where they were from. And um, they, um, along with their uncle, so the two Tsenaha Bithnis sisters and their uncle, and one Tsenaha Bithnis sister had a husband. So the four of them left from there and they went to Fort Defiance. Yeah. Kind of like, probably like to turn themselves in because everyone was being rounded up. Yeah, yeah. You know how everyone was being rounded up, their crops were burned and yeah. stuff. So, yeah. and then from there they were told, oh yeah, the party already left. So you guys can follow and catch up. So they, um, so they, they were sent to Wingate. And so they went to Wingate. Um, Except when they left from Farmington, um, ba, um, the, the sister that wasn't married, she was single, she was sick. Mm -hmm. They said she was very sick, and she asked her sister to leave her behind. But her sister, sister said, said, no, I'm not going to leave, leave you behind. We're going to take you. So, so they took her. And, uh, and you know, right, when you were on that long walk trail, if you were sick, if you couldn't make it, they killed you. Yeah. If you were old grandma or a grandpa or a child they, yep. they just kind of like killed you and yep. because you couldn't held keep couldn't keep up yeah so her sister said no um um you're gonna stay with me and i'm gonna we're gonna take you and so then they went to wingate so from wingate since every, you know since people were being killed off so she was like most likely to be killed off because she was sick so they went into mountain areas that way that's how they got to how they got to Huelte. They mm -hmm. went over there and um, and Huelte, they were, um, the sisters were protected by their uncle mm -hmm. a lot because of everything that was going on yep. there, right? You know, um, rape, people selling themselves for sex, you know, all that kind of stuff yeah, for food, they, right? Uh, raiding parties yeah. be coming in too. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. So they, um, so they were, um, so they were, they were protected by, by him. And, and she got better and she made it back. And I think we're her descendants, the, the sick grandmother, the sick oh, sister. Wow. Yeah. Talk about strength. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's, it's good to hear different perspectives about the long walk because it's, um, people think it's just, oh, it was a walk, you gotta get there. You stayed there, you came back. Those who died of sickness and hunger. But no, it's all walks of life from yeah. all ages. All different types of health. Just to get to rally point was a struggle. Mm -hmm. Just to get there was a bigger struggle. To survive was another one. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't just sitting in the prison camp guarded by guards. It was about them allowing rape 
yeah. sex slaves, raiding parties to come through and look away. Mm -hmm. But again, that's not, should we be, sh should we be shocked that it's very similar to today's prison system? <laughs> <laughs> you know? right? no. So, and then, uh, then for us to come back and then we're direct descendants and have the genes of those survivors. And we can think about whether we want to share this or not. I'm actually legally blind. Really? I have about, yeah, I have about 10, about 10 percent um, or, you know, or slightly less than that of my vision remaining. Wow. Um, I started in when I was in the military, I started getting um, these just really, really random weird headaches. Yeah. And my eyes would hurt. And so they used to give me these really huge ibuprofen pills. Yeah. And I would take that. Yeah. Um, by the time I got out, um, my eyes would get real sensitive to the sun. Uh -huh. Just like sensitive. And that's when, um, well, it, I was actually in the military when they diagnosed me with uveitis. Yeah. I didn't really understand what that meant. Yeah. Um, and basically what it is is arthritis in the eyes. Oh, wow. And uh, so then I got out. When I got out, that was when uh, they gave me steroid eye drops as well. And so that increases the pressure. And then that's called, like he said, glaucoma. Wow. Right? You know, I have cataract surgery in both eyes. Yeah. Um, I currently have an implant on this side just so it can leak, you know. Oh, really? And in the process, um, like, I lost a lot of vision. Yeah. Like, I have no um, no peripheral vision. Huh. Or I don't do yard work because, you know, branches stick down. Yeah. So I don't, so you know, I don't want to accidentally, one, yeah. Yeah. And then I can't, I don't really run anymore. I used to do a lot of trail running. So, I, I think we ran into each other's up there, right? trail running i think we did and i remember i think it was you because i remember if it was you you said to me do you have like a gun or <laughs> like a knife <laughs> on you because there are wild animals out here yeah there's like mountain lions yeah he said they'll just come out of somewhere nowhere and you need to be able to protect yourself I wasn't even thinking this stuff, and I was just out there running. <laughs> yeah, and that's I was probably like, was. <laughs> After that, I kind of, you know, I was like, whoa, I better not, like, run out here by myself so much. But since then, I have two friends, two friends who told me about their encounters. One mm -hmm. said she was stalked by a wolf. Yeah, the Mexican like, wolves. Like, a pack of wolf. Yeah, yeah. wolves, yeah. But anyway, so, like, I stopped oh running because I can't see the ground, and there's, like, rattlesnakes, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Meanwhile, you were working mm -hmm. on your PhD at the time. Yeah. <laughs> So meanwhile, like he said, I'm working on my PhD. I'm like, oh my God, how is this is going to work out? And I just, yeah, I'm a, I'm a professor now still, even with that. He wants to help me and he's generous and stuff. And for a long time, I was like, no, I can do it myself. <laughs> and I've learned to, I've learned to accept help, you yeah. know, from him. And I've learned to not try to be too independent. There's so many people out there who are facing challenges that are personal who feel mm -hmm. like, I can't get a can't PhD. Mm, I can't yeah. get a successful home. I can't have a supportive husband because I have this challenge I need to deal with for the rest of my life. Yeah. But they hear your story and see what you've accomplished. That gives them hope and insight. It's like I said, it's a unique aspect of me that I don't share with people. I'm kind of like... I'm also still, uh, I'm embarrassed to use my cane mm. and I'm trying to overcome that. You know, my husband's like, here's your cane, use it. And I'm like, no. So like, go see him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to use it right now. It does uneven, you know, yeah, you can but, walk better with it. Mm -hmm. But I do walk better with, better with it. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I'm a little straighter and I can look yeah. and see and see things and I don't get the back aches. If I don't have it, I have to look where I'm stepping and I'm looking down and I don't want to. I'm trying to not bump into things. Just so many distract. Use a cane. There's nothing wrong with it. There's yeah. nothing. Again, you're gonna even someone mm -hmm. who doesn't probably want to use a cane. They see you with a cane. They see you doing the work. Be like, I can do that. Yeah. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with that. Mm -hmm. And she looks much more happier than me walking in public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I'll give it a try. Give it a try. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Again, we're setting examples. That's why we're doing a series. We're setting yeah. examples. We're, you know, life throws you lemons, you make lemonade. Mm -hmm. When the rain comes, you put some slickers on, learn how to dance in the rain. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're resilient for a reason, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take off. How good she? Oh. How good Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks to see you again after yeah. many, many years. Many, many years. Nice yeah. to meet you, nice Joey. Thank you. Take care, buddy. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That was a cool experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got to check out the video, but I'm glad I listened in on <laughs> all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's. I think you guys will see it, so yeah. I will give you a heads up. Probably okay. be a month or two, so. Yeah. All right, Kehet. Oh. Uh,